of feet of material comes in from naval cameramen all over the world. Some of it finds its way onto the cinema and television screens, and some of it doesn't. Well, we thought it might be a good idea to come together some of this material and put it, as it were, into the scran bag to remind you of some of the things that happened in the Royal Navy in 1967. Now, if you don't see yourself or your own ship on the screen, it may not be altogether our fault. Get onto the nearest cameraman and make sure that he shoots something, or if necessary, someone, for next year's edition. Now, there were some events of 1967 in the Royal Navy which had much more than just a service interest. Britain's first Polaris submarine has been news ever since Queen Elizabeth the Queen Mother launched her at Barrow in Furness and named her HMS Resolution. A year later, in October 1967, Resolution commissioned on time and cameramen had a chance to go on board. Torpedo tubes are about the most conventional thing about her. Nuclear powered and at 7,000 tons as big as a pre-war cruiser, she'll stay submerged for the whole of her two-month patrols. So accommodation for her two alternate crews needs to be spacious and comfortable. Just one of her 16 missiles could destroy a city the size of London. With Resolution and her sister ships Renown, Repulse and Revenge, the Royal Navy will shortly take over Britain's nuclear deterrent. By way of contrast, a reminder of what life aboard a sub used to be like. T-boats were highly sophisticated craft for their time, but by 1967, for the earlier types, time was up. The 60 or so members of her crew were saying farewell to HMS Token. On September the 8th, she sailed into Gosport for her final payoff after 22 years service. A call to action in March for the fleet air arm. Their bombs were needed to deal with the desperate threat of the Torrey Canyon, a ground on the Seven Stones Reef. Buccaneers followed the sea vixens into the attack in an attempt to open up the great tanker so that the oil still left aboard could be fired. It was a rare chance to drop live bombs on a real target and it made good pictures. Bombs gone, and with the RAF going in later with napalm, the operation was declared a success. The grim black clouds towering up above the ship spelt hope at last for the beaches of Britain. After the action, time for the tales of what it was like up there. En route for the debriefing, the air crews exchanged experiences. There I was, Roger, upside down with nothing on the clock. But line shooting apart, for the fleet air arm it was a job well done. A piece of brilliantly accurate bombing. For the Navy's oldest seagoing ship, a rendezvous with Gypsy Moth 4 off Cape Horn at the end of March, as she battled with the worst seas in the world on the homeward leg of her epic voyage. Board protector, press and broadcasting teams there to report Sir Francis Chichester's triumphant achievement. The inhabitants of the Antarctic have very nearly seen the last of HMS Protector. In 1967 she celebrated her 30th birthday and soon she's to be replaced by a Danish built ship to be converted in Britain and renamed Endurance. But yet another patrol in the ice lay ahead for Protector when she sailed from Portsmouth in October on her last voyage. A hovercraft was sent out too for evaluation trials in the very rigorous operational conditions that spell life in the Antarctic. It was back home in April for HMS Valiant, the second of the Royal Navy's nuclear-powered fleet submarines. A Wessex helicopter of 819 Squadron from Ballykelly met her with mail as she surfaced off Northern Ireland. Valiant had just completed a record submerged trip for a British submarine. 11,200 miles from Singapore in just four weeks. A chance to prove the vessel in all undersea conditions. But for the moment, the news from home was all that mattered, and how to get it aboard. No easy job with a strong breeze blowing. But willing hands were ready and waiting as soon as the chopper was on target.
From his perch up aloft in London, Nelson looks down on a ceremony to honour a sea hero of our time. On the 2nd of April, His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh, with the first Sea Lord, Admiral Sir Beryl Begg, arrived in Trafalgar Square to meet Lady Cunningham before unveiling a memorial to her late husband, Admiral of the Fleet, Viscount Cunningham of Hindhope. His distinguished career reached a climax with the surrender of the Italian fleet during the Second World War and his memorable signal be pleased to inform their lordships that the Italian battle fleet now lies at anchor under the guns of the fortress of Malta. Great words and great days for the Navy. Things have certainly changed since then, but uh, not altogether for the worse. After years of uncertainty, in 1967, with all the new construction and other things going on, the shape of the future Navy began to emerge more clearly. From some points of view, it looked quite promising. Third Officer Felicity Taylor, J to her friends, comes on duty to take up what's usually thought of as very much a man's job. At HMS Fulmer in February, she started work as the Navy's first woman air traffic controller. Four, three, three glide path in your descent. Now on the glide path, on the centre line, look ahead and land. Just finished talking down 7-0. For the boys in the Buccaneers, it must be nice to have a female voice chatting them up on the RT for a change. Jay started life in the Wrens as a radar plotter, and then after a period in admin at Yeovilton, she chose to tackle the year's training for her present job. So now she's well equipped to keep a sharp eye on just what the lads at Lossie are up to. At Faslane on the Firth of Clyde, the new base for our changing fleet had cause for celebration. HMS Neptune, commissioned in August, and the captain's wife, Mrs. D.G. Kent, cut the cake with traditional ceremony. Everything else about the base is keyed to the future. Building started in November 1963. The classrooms and training areas simulate operational conditions at sea. Here, submariners of the Polaris fleet are being trained in space-age electronics and learn to master the complex computers which control their deadly missiles. It's a world where the boffins are very much in charge. In fact, the sailor of the 70s will need to be quite a scientist himself. A mighty long way from what some of us used to learn about firepower from the GIs of Whale Island. Nuclear subs bring new hope to another time-honoured home of the Navy. Chatham is to become Britain's second nuclear dockyard, Recise the first. A four million pound development scheme is underway at Chatham. When it's completed, it'll mean two nuclear fleet submarines can be docked and serviced at the same time. There were new ships in plenty in 1967. HMS Renown, the second Polaris submarine, was launched from Camel Laird's yard in Birkenhead in February by Mrs. Healy, wife of the Defence Minister. The Prime Minister's wife was guest of honour in April at Vickers Yard at Barrow in Furness for the commissioning of HMS Warspite, the Navy's third nuclear fleet submarine, which she'd launched some 18 months previously. Mrs. Wilson was escorted on board by Warspite's commanding officer, Commander Robert Squires. Warspite's one of the six nuclear fleet submarines at present in service, building or on order for the Royal Navy. Commander Squires came to Warspite after serving as number one of the Navy's first nuclear sub, Dreadnought. So he's no stranger to the problems of fighting and navigating these very advanced vessels. A boost for the chart makers with the launch by Lady Bush at Brook Marine Lowstoft of HMS Bulldog, first of a new type of coastal survey craft. help the hydrographer and his staff keep tabs on the shape of the seabed, something that interests the submariner even more than most. For the surface sailor, two more Leander-class frigates. From Yarrow's yard in Glasgow, Jupiter slid into the water to swell the growing numbers of these versatile ships. Her sister ship Andromeda is a southerner, built at Portsmouth Dockyard. There were big ones too. The 12,000 tonne Intrepid, commissioned in March, is one of the new assault ships designed to put fighting men ashore with heavy equipment in any part of the world. These ships are floating symbols of inter-service cooperation. They're manned jointly by the Royal Navy, the Royal Marines and the Army, 
And of course, they're designed to cater for all the extra troops who may be embarked. They can be swiftly taken ashore by assault craft or hovercraft, operating out of the ship's stern from a dock that can be flooded at will. Maneuvering the assault fleet ashore is a job for the Royal Marines. Helicopters too can be used for ferrying troops and equipment. The ship herself can remain well offshore to control the operation as the choppers and the landing craft go into the attack. Intrepid and her sister ship Fearless are a very necessary addition to the fleet in these days of ever diminishing shore bases. The same goes for the growing fleet of big Royal Fleet auxiliaries like Tarbot Ness. She was named at Swan Hunter's Yard at Wall's End on Tide in February by Lady Winterbottom. But she didn't seem keen to be launched. Ah oh well, while we're waiting, let's take a look at something that goes off all too easily. This kind of job calls for a cool head as well as plenty of guts. Royal Navy clearance divers from Plymouth put on a demonstration to show how it's done. All kinds of mysterious objects come their way and whatever the problem, it pays to approach it warily. Recognition of their work came in March with two Queen's commendations for, in the words of the citation, removing a highly dangerous German bomb from the city centre of Bristol. It might have caused considerable damage and loss of life, said one commendation, if it hadn't been for the exceptional presence of mind and great courage of Chief Petty Officer William Witherell, George to his messmates. Well, I must admit I wouldn't be too keen on a job like that myself. Chief, congratulations on your award. Was that the most uh, interesting assignment you've had during the last year or so? No, I don't think so. I think uh, Western Supermare was the most interesting one. Well, what was so good about that? Um, well, it started off with a small boy finding a bomb on the beach, or in the mudflats, just off the beach. And uh, after we'd walked across there, we found all sorts of stuff, you know. And uh, stuff we couldn't find in the books, you know. What you know. sort of thing? Well, it was, uh, one was a torpedo warhead with some old fins stuck on the end of it. Um, there was mines, which we recognised, of course, but uh, dummies and odd bits and pieces, depth charges with queer fins on. Um, we traced it and we found that it was an, uh, an old experimental ground, you know, during the war, the, where the boffins played around with the bits and pieces. Well, it must be a fascinating job, but it also strikes me as a damn dangerous one. Do you get many volunteers for this kind of work? Um, yes, we get plenty of volunteers, but um, the failure rate is quite high on the course. Uh, it's a six months course, of course. And pretty tough, is it? <coughs> Very tough. You had to be a diver as well. Well, this is the course. It's six months diving, clearance diving. And um, six weeks of that, about six weeks, is bomb and mine disposal training. And uh, the diving side of it is, what, heavy, seven hours a day diving sort of thing for, what, six weeks mm -hmm. at a time, and then a break of a week doing something else, and then off you go diving again. Pretty hectic. Over the mud, everywhere. Well, what do you get if you can stick it? Um, 12 bob a day, and uh, a member of the best branch of the Royal Navy. Well, of course, you would say that, Chief. Anyway, thanks very much, and uh, there you are. There's 12 bob a day for you, if you fancy it. Ah, she's decided to go after all. To be fair, it wasn't really a technical hitch. The launch had to be delayed till next day because conditions weren't right in the river. And if she was reluctant, well, a lot of hard work lies ahead for Tarpet Ness. The fleet could well depend more and more on supply operations like this. Trim is maintained during unloading from the new RFAs from a central control point with the help of closed circuit television. This is Lyness, and like her sister ships, Stromness and Tarbotness, she's purpose-built. 
Essentially, she's a highly mechanized store for 100,000 items with the shell of a ship built round it. Some of the skills involved don't change. Such operations have always been a stern test of seamanship. The third ship in company with HMS Hermes is the RFA Ulna, a pattern of replenishment at sea that's already become standard practice. For HMS Hampshire, a trip in May to Montreal and Expo 67. She crossed the Atlantic in company with ships of the Dartmouth Training Squadron. Conditions weren't always this calm. There was a bit of a chop on later when the flag officer's second in command home fleet, Rear Admiral Pollock, was transferred from HMS Scarborough back to his flagship. Swinging chaps, these admirals. He even managed to keep his cap on. For Hampshire, reaching Canada called for the normal courtesies of a naval arrival. The ships of the Dartmouth Training Squadron went on to visit other Canadian ports and the United States. Hampshire secured alongside with the weird skyline of Expo in the background, and the time had come for the sailors from Britain, many of them visiting the New World for the first time, to take a look around this unique, indeed fantastic exhibition. There must have been a lot to distract them. But after all, it's not every day you get the chance of a run on a monorail. The United States Pavilion with its parade of Hollywood stars. Sightseeing apart, there was a chance to get together with other visitors to the exhibition. By the time Hampshire left for home, everyone who'd enjoyed the attractions of Expo 67 and Montreal thought Canada was quite a place. Operating from Gibraltar, HMS Dreadnought had a job of work to do off the Azores in June. A West German freighter, the Esberger chemist, had broken her back and was drifting in the open sea. An obvious danger to shipping, so her owners asked the Admiralty to finish her off. By the way, the Navy's cameramen were flown to the scene by two RAF shacklemen. But not even Dreadnought's torpedoes were quite enough. HMS Salisbury had to join in later with gunfire. These pictures, as I've said, were only made possible through the splendid cooperation of 120 Squadron RAF, and we were much distressed to hear of their tragic losses in accidents later in the year. Early in 1967, the Royal Marines escorted the Colour Party in a nocturnal march past at Masawa in Ethiopia. Apparently it was too hot to hold the ceremony by day. A Russian contingent was also there. The occasion was a passing out parade for naval cadets. Emperor Haile Selassie presented them with ceremonial swords.
There was also a review of the visiting warships. They included a recent type of Russian guided missile destroyer, some of her forecastle equipment concealed from view. The United States Navy was represented by the radar picket destroyer Viso. And from Britain came the tribal class frigate Nubian. A chopper's eye view of HMS Hermes as she sailed through what was once the crater of a vast volcano in the eastern Mediterranean. An unusual sight for the inhabitants, living on what's virtually the rim of the crater. Lucky for them that there's now seawater instead of lava in the middle. Full marks to the cameramen of Hermes who sent us a fairly full record of what must have been a pleasant cruise. It included a visit to Athens and the ruins of the Acropolis which still stands as a monument to the world's first democratic state. And for the modern citizens of the Greek capital, a welcome aboard the 27,000 ton carrier. And a chance to get on friendly terms with the crew. Naples was also on the itinerary. There, the men of Hermes put on their war paint to entertain a party of orphan children. They lapped it all up with gusto, but the ice cream supplies lasted out. Guests and hosts alike were obviously bursting with high spirits. Parties went ashore to visit the ruins of Pompeii and pick up some knowledge you don't get from postcards. The ancient world too had its share of natural disasters, one of the worst when lava from Vesuvius overwhelmed what was once a flourishing city. A visit to the Italian capital and a chance to drop a hard-earned coin or three in the Trevi fountain. It was too dark to film what the boys did after they'd had a look at the Vatican. Another fine show when Hermes crossed the line, the captain was first to receive the accolade from King Neptune. at Malta and the timely arrival of some very welcome visitors. It was a short flight to indulgence from the tail end of a British winter for some of the men's wives and families and the husbands were on parade to greet them. A reunion that gave great pleasure to all concerned, not forgetting the children. Towards the end of the year came by far the biggest naval operation of 1967, covering the British withdrawal from Aden. It wasn't to take place till the end of November, but in mid-October men of 42 Commando arrived to set up rearguard protection for the withdrawing troops. The job ashore too for volunteers from HMS Phoebe, the searching of terrorist suspects, part of the tough task of maintaining security which was soon to pass from British hands. The possibility of terrorist attack remained till the very end. A fleet of 25 ships was assembling for the final stages of the evacuation, during which the Navy took over responsibility for air defence and strike operations in South Arabia. It was the biggest concentration of British naval power for many years. Admiral Sir Michael Lefanu, Commander-in-Chief Middle East, was in charge of the whole operation. He was on board the assault ship Intrepid for a fly-past of buccaneers and sea vixens. A sight which gave much encouragement to the men ashore engaged in the heavy job of packing up and getting out. Landing craft were called in to transport some of the heavier vehicles and equipment. Stores in vast quantities as well as troops were airlifted out by helicopters which maintained what was virtually a shuttle service out to the fleet at sea. The 
servicemen who still remained in Aden really had their hands full. This is what happens when a whole army moves house. Left behind in Aden, hundreds of houses and flats specially built to accommodate British servicemen and their families. Now they were empty. After 128 years, Britain was moving out. Well, it's nothing to do with me. A pity there wasn't room for the kitchen sink. About 25,000 people altogether had to be flown out by the RAF in the last month at the rate of about a thousand a day. They were taken in transport aircraft to Bahrain where they had a chance to wash and change before they flew back by airliner to the cheerful prospect of winter in Britain. The end was near when the Governor Sir Humphrey Trevelyan made his final round of farewells. But for the Commander-in-Chief, what was perhaps the tensest part of the whole operation still lay ahead. For him and for the men of 42 Commando, who were the last of all to lower the flag and make their getaway. Under cover of darkness, the Marines withdrew from Mala and Steamer Point, leaving the security of Aden in the hands of the South Arabian Army. And so, exit Britain from Aden, with the Navy playing a vital role as it will undoubtedly continue to do, however much the pattern of Britain's defence overseas changes. And now let's end this edition of Scranbag with a look ahead to the future. With two launches of another Polaris submarine, HMS Repulse, another guided missile destroyer, HMS Norfolk, and finally a glimpse of HMS Resolution, which next February will be at Cape Kennedy to fire Polaris missiles on her sea trials. The Duchess of Norfolk was at the Swan Hunter Yard at Wall's End on Tyne to launch the ship that bears her name. Of course, a great many other things happened in the Navy during the year, not all of them recorded on film. But we were there for the launch of the third nuclear-powered Polaris sub Repulse, a Vickers ship built at Barrow in Furness. And that's about it for 1967. Send us all the 16 and 35 millimeter film you can, showing the Royal Navy at work and play in 1968.